Hi everyone, welcome back to another Neuro 481 lecture. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the frigid temperatures this weekend. Uh, it's a beautiful transition from summer through a quick fall and uh, into winter apparently. And uh, congratulations on the exam last week. Uh, I know that can be an excruciating process, uh, but I kind of view my role as a coach for you guys and uh, just the same as a good coach would not make um, easy trainings necessarily. A good coach is going to make, a, uh, like if, if you're training a track team, you're not just going to make them do easy jogs every time. You're going to make them run up a mountain and, and learn the pain and, and uh, expose them to the stress that will make them stronger and better in the long run. Now, of course, you also need rest periods so that your body can recover and so your mind can recover. So I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of rest after the exam, but uh, I, I really do uh, want to help you guys be as prepared as possible for grad school, med school, whatever endeavor you're going into after this. And, uh, and so that's kind of my role is to uh, put you through a little bit of stress and excruciating pain and then help you recover afterwards and, and become better. So don't don't look at yourself. Uh, don't look down on yourself if you feel like you didn't do as well as you wanted to do. We have uh, a lot more to go in the course, and so hopefully uh, can give you a sense of how you might improve or what you might focus on for uh, bettering your study habits and asking questions that might help you understand the material better. Uh, and if you did well, uh, congratulations, because that's not an easy test. So. Uh, I hope that this second uh, half of the semester will be quite a bit different, but also uh, exciting and motivating and uh, interesting to you. And, and, and like I said, a lot of this lab course is meant to show you how neuroscience is applied in a whole variety of ways in the real world, uh, whether that's more in the psychological aspects or in sort of the engineering aspects or in the medical aspects. And so... Uh, it's really a smattering of topics and we cut a broad swath and shave close at the same time so it's it, it's hard to get a grasp on all of this uh, but you're doing great so far so um, <clears throat> let's just jump into this this week's topic which is statistics and a little bit of uh, epidemiology as well so uh, I thought especially in the current climate of coronavirus that uh, we could focus a little bit on epidemiology, but also what we traditionally do in this course is practice how to use statistics. And uh, hopefully you've all had statistics, and if you haven't or if it's been a long time, that's okay. I'm going to do a quick review, but obviously statistics in and of itself can be an entire course or m multiple, multiple courses, and so uh, there's no way we can cover every single uh, important topic in statistics just in this lecture, but we'll try to make sure that you at least know the basics of how to apply it, how to interpret things appropriately, and uh, and, and that's actually one of the most useful and valuable tools that you can come away with in, in college, really. I feel like every specialty, even <laughs> in journalism, should understand uh, how to use statistics because that's how we interact and interpret the world. It's how we understand the world. And uh, it's important to have an understanding of both the limitations of statistics and also how statistics comes into being, where it's derived from, uh, and how we apply it, and how we interpret it. And, and <clears throat> it, it really is a valuable, essential um, uh, field to understand in any of the sciences. And so hopefully you can come away with a better, renewed sense of, of why statistics is so important. Um, <clears throat> now, when, when you go into whatever field you go into, you're going to be asked, you're going to become specialists and experts in your field. And you'll be asked by everyone, by family, friends, uh, other experts in the field, journal publications. You'll be asked by journalists, you know, who are trying to report on your results and on your your studies, your discoveries, your improvements, um, whatever it is in your field. They'll want to know how people will want to know how do they um, interpret and apply whatever project work you're doing. And so you need to ensure that you understand how to appropriately analyze 
and interpret the data and the evidence yourself and then also how to explain that in easy to understand terms for the general public and and most importantly in appropriate terms for the general public and so I, I figure you know we can talk a lot about the jargon of statistics there is there are so many terms and little things that are a very specific language to statistics and it's okay if you don't remember all of that uh, what I want to do today is just kind of put it into easy to understand terms and uh, I think the easiest way to do that is to sort of skip over all the <laughs> technicalities and, and let's just go straight to an actual study and walk through the, the methods of interpretation so we can understand the study and then we'll kind of jump around um, through some technical terminology, through some calculations, and, uh, and then we're gonna apply all of this to our own experiment. Now, normally in this course, what we do is gather uh, data from all of you students, and uh, we use that data to conduct an actual uh, experiment that we do statistical interpretation on, and we analyze what is significant, what's not significant, and so we gather the data from yourselves and uh, apply it. But what we're going to do this semester in order to minimize uh, viral risk and transmission is use the data from students from a prior semester, and so not as fun, I know, but uh, hopefully we can still uh, walk away with a much improved understanding of statistics and then when you guys go into your uh, postgraduate work uh, you will be rock stars and and very valuable to your research teams and to your medical teams in understanding literature and conducting experiments okay great so let's jump right in okay so this is an actual study from 2016 out of the Netherlands and in this, researchers wanted to examine whether low blood pressure upon standing, which we call orthostatic hypotension, meaning you stand up straight and you get low blood pressure, they wanted to see whether this uh, low blood pressure could be linked to dementia in older age, whether it's Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, etc. There's a lot of types of dementia but they just said dementia in general. It was found that people with orthostatic hypotension who had an average age of 68 years old, they had a 15% greater chance of developing dementia over a 15 year follow-up period. Uh, so where they got that from was this thing called an odds ratio. The odds ratio was 1.15, meaning they're 1.15 times as likely to develop dementia. So that's where they got this 15% greater chance of developing dementia. That's where the number came from. And it says there was a 95% confidence interval ranging from 1.00 to 1.34 with a p-value of 0 0.05. Now you guys all probably know already, obviously, that uh, in science, sort of the standard cutoff for significance is this probability value of 0 0.05. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and in this too, they use a 95% confidence interval which is actually the exact same thing, just sort of the inverse. Instead of saying, uh, you know, uh, the, this 5% at the tips of the data, they're saying we're 95% confident that this experimental group's data lies somewhere between 1.00 and 1.34. Or a better way of saying this is that if we were to conduct this experiment 100 times, 95 of the time, 95% of the time, our results would match the true results from the entire population. So in statistics, we're always taking a sample size out of a whole population. It, it would be very difficult to ever actually get an entire uh, population size sample. So we're always taking little samples and we wanna know how much do our samples vary from the true value of the entire population? Or in other words, how much variance is there in the uh, different distributions of data from control groups and uh, experimental groups, or in this case, what we're actually doing is what's called a case control study. We're taking cases, people who have cases of orthostatic hypotension versus controls who don't, and we're following them over a progressive period of time. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's let's jump a little bit into case control studies and how they're done, and then we'll come back to uh, stats interpretation, and then we'll come back to the problem, okay? Okay. 
So an odds ratio just suggests the odds of having a disease in people who are exposed to some risk factor or who have some um, predilection or some, uh, it could be any variety of things, people who have some risk factor versus those who do not have the risk factor. And we want to know whether the disease is correlated to that risk factor. Now the, the problem with all of these sort of epidemiologic studies is that we cannot prove in any way whether there's a causative effect, causation. Um, there are certainly um, data that will suggest causation and we can actually tease it out in other with other methods that we won't get into here. The gold standard of course is randomized controlled trials like if you want to know whether a drug is effective on a disease you create a randomized controlled trial where you separate two randomized groups give one the experimental treatment and the other not and then prove that there's a causative effect from your intervention. But uh, in this case, we're just sampling data that's available to us. And so we can't prove a causative effect. We can only assess whether there's a correlation between the risk factor and the disease. So uh, odds ratio, we're going to look at people who have the disease versus controls who do not. We're going to follow them over time. And the odds ratio is simply a calculation of those who have the disease uh, and were exposed to the risk factor divided by... Uh, the letter B here, so A divided by B, so those who do not have the disease who are also exposed to the risk factor, and then divide that ratio by the, the other ratio, which is C over D, so those who have the disease but did not have exposure to the risk factor, and then uh, divided by D, those who do not have the disease and do not have the risk factor. So it's just uh, the ratio of A to B divided by the ratio of C over D and the mathematics makes it easier. It's actually just A times D divided by B times C. So either of those um, calculations will give you the proper odds ratio. Relative risk is actually a very similar concept. Relative risk is the likelihood of getting a disease following a certain exposure, but this is done via cohort studies, which are a little bit different, and so the relative risk calculation is, is also a little bit different. Cohort studies, I actually remember this, um, you, can, you get tested on this in boards and things in, in medical school. So uh, cohort study, since it has an O and an O, uh, you're taking identical groups. You're taking normal groups of people. You don't know who has the disease or doesn't have it yet. So you're comparing O's versus O's um, as opposed to case control, which has an A in case and an O in control. You're taking A people who have the disease and O people who don't have the disease. So you, those, it's just a mnemonic, but um, cohort studies, you're taking just some population, some sample group, um, <clears throat> and you are analyzing the incidence of disease over time. And so you can assess relative risk by a similar equation. It's the ratio of people who have the disease over the total number of people who were exposed to the risk factor. And then that, divide that by the people who don't have the disease divided by the sum of people who were not exposed to the risk factor. So let's just, that, that's probably a little confusing. Let's actually look at our, uh, some, some actual data here. So if we take this cohort of people, um, or depending on which calculation we're doing, a case control, let's say we have people who have been diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 and those who have not been diagnosed. So we're taking a case control, people with the disease and without. And we look at risk assessment based on whether these people state that they never wore a mask, they refused to wear a mask, versus those that said they tried to always wear a mask whenever they could, whenever they were at a public space or whatever, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so we have these numbers that we get. Uh, 355 people with the disease who say they generally did not wear a mask and 140 people with the disease who said that they did wear a mask and then we can look at uh, the number of people without the disease that we try to have in our control group and then our calculations here are simply for the odds ratio uh, <clears throat> well let's do relative risk first sorry so relative risk 355 over the sum of total people who say that they generally don't wear a mask and then we take uh, the incidence among amongst the mask group as well so 140 people divided by the sum of the total people who say they generally wear a mask and then we just divide those two so it shows that the relative risk of not wearing a mask is 1.92, meaning you're almost twice as likely to get COVID-19 if you don't wear a mask. 
Uh, and you might make other inferences there too, like a mask is twice as effective as preventing COVID-19 as not. But in reality, you would actually need to do randomized control trials to prove the causative uh, effect of the mask and, and, and more specific testing there. But, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a whole branch of inferential statistics and things like that that's really interesting. But let's go on to odds ratio now. So we'll see how it's slightly different here. Odds ratio in the no mask group turns out to be 0.113 and the odds of disease in the mask group is 0.056. So you take those that ratio between the two and it shows again that they're about twice as likely to get the disease if they don't wear a mask. But you can see the odds ratio is slightly different than relative risk and that's why it says for the odds ratio if prevalence is low that the ratios tend to be almost equivalent. And, and, and you can see why that is mathematically in the equation. You're dividing A uh, divided by the sum of A plus B. So if A is very, very small, it's going to approximate just A over B. <clears throat> so um, if you're curious about why you would do one study versus the other, you can look at this. So case control studies, they tend to be cheaper and quicker and easier. And, and so... Uh, so that's great, but the disadvantages is that typically you're relying on memory and uh, of the subjects or self-reporting and, and the retrospection can make it prone to bias. Now, if we contrast that with uh, cohort studies, these are usually prospective. They can be retrospective if you're, you're analyzing, you know, a set of data that's available to you out of a cohort of people. But um, <clears throat> again, these ones... Uh, these are these are great for uh, rare exposures, but they tend to be a little more difficult to conduct because you're following people over time, and so there tends to be dropout rates, and you don't know who's dropping out. Is it the diseased people? Is it um, you know you know those those things can bias your data quite a bit, and then uh, <clears throat> and that that makes it hard to follow diseases, especially that have long latencies or that are very rare. Okay, anyway. Uh, odds ratio can actually be used for some other cool stuff too. Like if we look at this, let's say you have a sample of data that uh, analyzes an outbreak in a local community and you want to know where did this outbreak begin? Uh, and, and so you, an you interview all these people, you say, did you visit the grocery store uh, you know, in the last couple weeks since you've been sick or before you were sick? Did you visit the local Halloween corn maze? Did you go to church? Did you play at the park? Did you fly through the airport? Did you get food at a restaurant? All these things. You interview all these 200 people in the local community and uh, get a sampling of who's been diagnosed, first of all, and then whether they attended these events and, and became ill subsequently or whether they did not become ill. And they don't have to, it doesn't matter, you're not looking at exactly when they became ill. Uh, so, you know, there's some limits to the data here, but uh, you just want to get a sense of the odds ratio. Did someone have a higher risk of getting sick from any one of these particular events? So if we go through the data and analyze here, what we can do is just type in the odds ratio calculation and... Uh, <clears throat> So we get, you know, uh, the columns B over C divided by the column D over E. And that gives us an odds ratio of 1.41 for the grocery store. So slightly elevated risk. Um, and we can see here as we expand out these values uh, that the fast food, or no, the airport also had a risk of 1.588. So slightly elevated risk there, but what really stands out in this data set is this 9.6 odds ratio, almost an order of magnitude higher than the average risk for these other places. So a 9.6 odds ratio for the people who attended church. So clearly there seems to have been some outbreak at the local church. Um, and, and, you know, these other values like 1.41 or 1.588, these can represent other things too. You can't prove this, but these could represent early outbreaks, early transmissions, and then uh, widespread community outbreak through what appears to be uh, church attendance in, in this particular case. So these odds ratios can be really useful for analyzing all sorts of epidemiologic phenomena. Now, like I said earlier, uh, 
this type of data gathering is really only capturing a snapshot in time. What we would really prefer to do is capture multiple data points over an extended period of time. And, uh, and, and the concept of this is shown in this figure. So if we have three different diseases, all of which cause a 10% mortality uh, over the course of a year, you can see that we wouldn't really capture the rate of mortality between A, B, or C, diseases A, B, or C. A has a very quick mortality that levels off, whereas uh, C has a very linear mortality, and then B has a delayed mortality. This, this is showing the rate of mortality or the force of mortality, and so we really want to capture um, these sorts of data points as well. So, uh, and, and referring to mortality, what we're trying to do here is capture out of the total population, we want to know, uh, first of all, the number of people that are even susceptible to get a disease. In general, that tends to be every human being to some degree, but, but sometimes there are diseases that only target very specific uh, cohorts of people. And then out of those susceptible people, we want to know the number of people who are actually exposed to the virus or exposed to the, the uh, risk factor. And then out of those, we want to know how many actually became infected. And then out of those, we want to know how many actually became ill. And then out of those, we want to know how many actually died. So obtaining these true numbers can be a very difficult process. Obviously, epidemiologists do the best that they can to obtain very accurate numbers. Uh, and, and we've seen that with, with the coronavirus that's uh, spreading this year in this pandemic. Um, the data has changed uh, slightly over time as we've gathered more and more data, which is what happens in statistics. It's what happens as we gather better sample sizes across different nations, across different populations, across different age groups, across different, uh, different uh, ethnicities and different genetics. And, and so uh, if we can capture all these numbers accurately, then we can obtain a very accurate death rate. And because our ability to capture the true numerators and true denominators uh, varies from country to country and from time to time and everything, the, the death rates of uh, COVID-19 have, have shown to be quite variable. Uh, and some of that certainly is because of our inability to capture uh, massive sample sizes of good data. And some of it's... Uh, variations in, in nation's healthcare system, some of its variations in genetics and age groups and, and all sorts of things. So it's been a very controversial topic, surprisingly, in, in politics. It's become very political. Um, what is the true infection rate? What is the true death rate? But if you're really interested in this sort of epidemiology, I, I think it's uh, immensely fascinating. Uh, also because, not, not just because of the pandemic this year and how much it's affected the world, but also because the 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 mathematics and the concepts behind all of this is is the same for any disease and so if you're going into medicine it, it doesn't really matter what specialty you're going into epidemiology is a very useful thing to know so if for example you're applying to med school this year and you didn't get in one of the most useful things you can do is just go do a one-year master's of public health and and learn good epidemiology and uh, the Johns Hopkins program has really done a great job this year of capturing uh, data from the coronavirus outbreak and so I would highly recommend reviewing their site for comprehensive data around the world uh, the best data we have really and, and really good analyses too that helps just even people without epidemiology degrees to understand and interpret the data. So uh, great resource there. Okay, let's move on to uh, statistical analysis and how we would determine whether something is statistically significant uh, from one group compared to another group. So uh, this is where p-values come into play and we'll go over that as well. So whenever you add up little pieces of data or little behaviors uh, to understand a generalized phenomenon, uh, they, they tend to group themselves into these bell curves or probability density functions or Gaussian curves. We actually saw some of these uh, Gaussian curves in the super resolution microscopy, if you remember, they tend to pop up everywhere in physics. Uh, for example, I've used them on research on uh, ferromagnetic film resonant frequencies in a magnetic field. 
or in a lot of diffusion equation modeling, this, this shows behavior of diffusion. How far does a molecule randomly walk during its diffusion process? This was some of Einstein's early research. It's actually how he calculated the the size of an atom or approximated it, and that was before some of his other uh, more brilliant and well-known work. Um, they These Gaussian curves pop up in wave function probabilities with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. They pop up in entropy calculations when you look at the behavior of molecules. Um, and sure enough, they pop up even in human behaviors, in human characteristics, whether it's how tall are humans, uh, they distribute themselves very well into a bell curve, or um, uh, all sorts of other things. Uh, data just tends to distribute in these probability distributions that look like a bell curve. And here we see the equation for it. It's this really cool equation that has some really interesting characteristics that we won't go into here. But this is also, th these equations are also immensely useful for modeling data. And that's why statistics uses them. Oh, you can also see in this figure that um, <clears throat> the it shows the, the sigma symbol here. This is uh, uh, showing the standard deviation. So within the first standard deviation from the mean, 68% of the population, 68% of the data will fall in that first standard deviation plus or minus from the mean. And then and if you go two standard deviations out, 95% of the data will be contained in that in two standard deviations. Within three standard deviations, that'll have 99.73% of the data. So that, that's just sort of how a normal distribution curve is distributed. So how does this help us at all to determine significance? Well, what we're doing with significance is we're taking two different distribution curves. Uh, we're, we're taking a control group and then we're taking an experimental group, which we've influenced in some way. We've done something to this uh, group or this group has been exposed to some risk factor, whatever it may be. We're taking the two means, the two averages of those two different groups and comparing them. And what's really interesting about this is that our brains actually can, we're, you know, humans are intelligent creatures. We can actually infer um, sort of significance just from looking at these curves. Um, so at the top curve there, you can see that the, the gray uh, on the left, let's say that's the control group, for example. And then we have some experimental group which we've influenced or exposed to something. Uh, th that experimental group, um, it, it, it's some, the mean is some distance away from the control group. So uh, we would say, well, you know, that looks like those groups are significantly different. And we see that their variance, the amount that uh, the, the sort of wideness of the curve, it doesn't overlap. The curves don't overlap very much with each other. Um, we compare that to the curves below in, in pair B. Here, you know, most people without even having statistics training would say, well, you know, the, the averages are, are far apart. They're actually the same distance apart as in pair A, but in pair B, there's a lot of overlap of the curves, meaning there's a lot of variance within each group. So it's a lot harder to say that those are statistically significant. Maybe just the sample size of, of one of those groups, you know, maybe just the sampling just so happened to create a mean that was slightly different from the control group, but the variances are so wide here that it doesn't really look like that has a high probability of being significantly different. And likewise, when you look at pair C, you can see, well, the, the the means are pretty close and the variances are tight. You know, there's not a lot of variance within groups, but the means are so close that, again, it doesn't really appear obvious that these two groups are necessarily significantly different from each other. So there you can see, without even having statistics training, you can sort of infer uh, what would be statistically significant or not. In pair A, um, it, well, it just turns out that the p-value is related directly to uh, to the area under the curve that overlaps between the two probability distributions. So pair A shows a very low overlap of curves, and so that one is most likely to be significantly different. It doesn't necessarily matter how far apart the means are. It doesn't really necessarily matter what the variances of each group are. Uh, what really matters here is how little the curves overlap with each other. That's what gives us our p-value.
So what we do in statistics and, and all of science really is we assume that there's no difference. We, we don't want to influence any bias into the system. We just want to say, let's assume that when we're testing drug A or uh, intervention A, that there's no difference. And we will have to prove it to ourselves if there is actually a difference. So we start with the assumption that there's no difference. Uh, that's called the null hypothesis. And we have to really prove it to ourselves beyond a reasonable doubt, let's say, uh, that there is a difference. And once we prove it with repeated measures and uh, high probability that, that our intervention is significantly different, it makes a significant difference, then we will ascribe a probability to that result and we will say, okay, now we reject the null hypothesis and we accept that there is actually some influence, there is some statistically significant difference in the experimental group compared to the control group. That's the whole idea of statistics. Now remember, uh, just a side point here, just because you have statistical significance doesn't necessarily mean you have clinical significance. For example, there have been many drugs that have been tested that uh, <laughs> pharmaceutical companies, by dropping out some of their negative results and things and publishing the studies that show good results, they can uh, finally achieve some statistical significance. Like, let's say, uh, control placebo groups have... Uh, you know, a 5% improvement, and with our drug, we get uh, an 8% improvement. Well, you know, that, that mean difference from 5% to 8%, that, that could easily be proven statistically significant if you can get the variances really tight. Um, but is an 8% versus a 5% actually clinically significant? Uh, over placebo, uh, it's hard to say. It sort of depends on whether there's uh, measurable factors, for example, like do patients report significant improvements or are there radiologic evidences of improvement or other uh, measures of, of actual effect. It relates to this thing called effect size. What we really want to calculate in statistics is not just significance, but also the magnitude of the effect of the uh, intervention or experimental treatment. This is why it's important to understand both uh, the power of statistics and the limits of statistics in whatever sort of uh, material you're analyzing. All right, so in statistics, we're essentially trying to obtain some probability, which is why it's called the p-value, the probability value, to determine whether our null hypothesis, you know, our, our assumption that there's going to be no differences here, whether um, we can reject that null hypothesis and say, no, the probability has gotten so great that there are differences here that we're going to reject the null hypothesis and uh, assume that the experimental condition is probabilistically uh, significantly different than our control group. And in science, we've come to accept, you know, 0 0.05 as the probability value, the p-value, that, that is an acceptable um, probability that our control and experimental conditions differ from each other. But really, a p-value of 0.05 is not a particularly uh, rigorous standard to adhere to. Uh, essentially, what you're saying there is that if we did this uh, study on, on, if we sampled, you know, an experimental condition 100 times, and we, we knew for a fact that there was no difference that we're using some placebo or that there's actually really literally no difference between control and experimental groups, that if we did the study 100 times, we're still going to obtain five out of those 100 studies that, uh, that shows a significant difference when there's actually not one. So another way of saying this is that if the p-value is small enough, uh, or in other words, the smaller the p-value, the, the smaller the probability that the null hypothesis is correct. So the smaller p-value means we're, 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 we're saying the probability of the null hypothesis cannot be true. There must be some significant difference. And so science has cut, said the bare minimum cutoff should be 1 out of 20, a 0.05 value. And also, it's worth pointing out that uh, a statistically significant result does not prove that our, our research hypothesis is correct. It doesn't prove that our experimental condition uh, 
is necessarily truly different. All it, all it does is give a probability, a suggestion, uh, provide support for the idea that our experimental condition is indeed, in fact, different than the control condition. So this is why it's important to actually write what your p-value is and, and not just say that it was less than some cutoff number. Um, so let's say you have a study uh, like the one that we started looking at. We'll go back to that in a minute. But let's say you have a p-value of 0 0.02, for example. What we would say here is that if uh, orthostatic hypotension truly has no effect on dementia whatsoever, um, <clears throat> that 2% uh, of the studies will still obtain an effect in the sample uh, just because of random errors, random sampling, random variance. So I know I'm being somewhat repetitive here, and I apologize for that. It's just that there's a lot of ways to say these things, and I'm, I'm trying to make sure that my point is clear. Um, it, it's, it's also worth pointing out that uh, p-value is is not uh, it does not represent the likelihood of rejecting a null hypothesis that it's actually true something called a type 1 error if you remember type 1 and type 2 errors so the p-value is not the probability that we got significance when there really wasn't significance in order to calculate those types of error rates it's actually much much more complicated you can actually use a Bayesian approach and, and simulation studies and calculate that uh, if, you're, if your cutoff p-value is a 0.05, if you say 0.05 is my threshold for significance, uh, you actually have a probability of at least 23% and sometimes up to 50%. You have a pr pr quite high probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis, which is kind of surprising. That means that a p-value of 0.05 will actually give you significant results quite a bit of the time even when there is truly no significant difference, uh, which is kind of surprising. And yet again, another reason why I say a uh, threshold of 0.05 for most studies needs to be <laughs> uh, greatly reduced. Um, P-value of 0.01 is kind of uh, the newer threshold. And really, in, as a matter of fact, you should always just report what your P-value actually was. All right. Now that I've talked so much about p-value, I'm actually going to try and convince you that uh, p-value is not really, the, at least not the only uh, statistical value that matters, not the only thing that you should use. Let's go back to our concept of confidence intervals. So uh, again, confidence intervals provide information about a range in which the true value lies with a certain degree of probability. And uh, more than that, more than p-value, it gives us a sense of the direction and strength of the demonstrated effect. So uh, a p-value is just sort of one number, but I want to know, you know, what is the what is the skew of the distribution of these curves, and how do they overlap with each other? And a confidence interval gives me a much better sense of that. Uh, so let's go to the problem again. Remember here also that a 95% confidence interval is the same idea as a p-value of 0.05, the 5% uh, p-value. Uh, it's sort of like a two-tail test where you're comparing both tails of the bell curve and their overlap with a control group. We're saying there's a 95% or 95% confident that this interval truly represents uh, the variance of data, the mean of the data. Uh, compared to the control group. Sorry if that's confusing there, but but let's just actually look at the numbers here. So when they say a 95% confidence interval ranging from 1.00 to 1.34, that gives me a lot of pause right away because by definition, your 95% confidence interval has to be over 1.00. If, if the confidence interval here ranged from 0.99 to 1.34, this would not have been significant, uh, same way that a p-value of 0.06 would not be significant. Anything, uh, when, when your experimental group, when the, when the confidence interval of your experimental group begins to overlap the control group, which by definition is 1.00, there's no longer the 95% confidence that your, your experimental group is statistically significant. So the fact that they are exactly borderline, p-value 0.05, confidence interval 1.00 to 1.34. This really would have had to be like confidence interval of 1.001 uh, 
or something because otherwise this this would have been rejected as not being significant so they are really borderline here with their uh, statistical significance so nevertheless let's assume that that's a, a good uh, representation of the population and that indeed there's a small but statistically significant 15 percent greater chance of developing dementia when you have orthostatic hypotension well let's go on let's read the next piece of data this risk did not correlate to one type of dementia over another but was similar for all types hmm, okay more specifically, a drop in systolic blood pressure significantly correlated with the dementia risk. So now, instead of just saying yes or no, do you have uh, <laughs> do you have orthostatic hypotension? They're going to correlate a, one specific data point of that orthostatic hypotension. They're going to correlate the systolic blood pressure to dementia risk. And here we see an odds ratio of 1.08. So an even smaller effect, really. It's it's an 8% increased risk but their 95% confidence interval, again, borderline 1.00 to 1.17, but our p-value is slightly greater here than before. And, then, and you might ask, how is that possible when, when uh, the, the confidence interval was so similar? But likely what's happening here is some skew of the curves and uh, there's a very low overlap in the area under the curve but the confidence intervals, because of the skew of the curve, the 95% confidence interval actually shows you better than the p-value uh, where the skew of the curve is and, and, and how close you are to significance or non-significance. And uh, that's why I think that confidence intervals are a better representation of the strength of, and the magnitude of your, of your effect. So when you graphically represent this, as you guys are going to do in a moment here, and I'll show you how to do all this, I'm going to, you know, the stuff you're going to do um, is uh, obviously oversimplified so that we can accomplish this in one lab period, but uh, I'm going to have you put error bars on your uh, means, on your averages of your groups, but really the, the error bars are a very generalized representation of the standard deviation in your data. A better representation would be error bars that are called uh, box and whiskers where it shows you essentially uh, these distributions and these confidence intervals in the error bars themselves and, and helps you better compare the variances between groups. Anyway, we'll see that in a minute. Let's, let's move on here. So, um, <clears throat> okay, those patients, those subjects who could not mount an adequate increase in heart rate to compensate for the drop in blood pressure also correlated to the risk of dementia. So what it's saying here is, you know, that when you stand up and get dizzy out of bed, your heart rate speeds up in order to compensate and pump more blood to your brain. And uh, they're saying that people who could not do that as well had an odds ratio, 1.39, of developing or 39 percent greater chance greater odds of developing dementia over time and that seems to make a lot of sense and in, and in fact we see here the 95 percent confidence interval ranges from 1.04 finally a, a decent number it's you know a, a little bit above 1.00 so that's good it's showing that there's a, some gap in the confidence uh, some gap between the distribution curves, I, I should say. So 1.04 to 1.85. But again here, our p-value is only 0 0.05, which is unusual. Again, there's some skewing of the distribution curves here between the control and the, and the orthostatic hypotension groups that is causing a weird alignment um, where confidence intervals and p-values do not necessarily exactly correlate because of the skew of these uh, curves. Okay, so this article was published in the Public Library of Science, which is the most massive <laughs> journal in the world, pretty much, uh, in terms of the number of publications that go out each year. So it's, you know, some some scientists have stopped looking on it as a, as a prestigious journal, and and a lot of stuff gets published in there that may be borderline. And this study certainly seems lucky in the sense that, wow, their data could have proven non-significance and might never have, have even been published, but they got it barely borderline, and uh, and so this was published. So it's hard to interpret, you know, whether, it's hard to interpret the magnitude of this effect. 
Nevertheless, let's say that you're one of the researchers or uh, maybe a, a family doctor and a patient asks you about this study, or let's say you're a neurologist and you're very curious about the uh, risk factors for dementia and you want to understand how, how, how should you interpret this study. So let's say a journalist calls you up and wants to write an article and asks you some questions. Which of the following statements is not a valid statement? So A, there is a statistically significant correlation between low blood pressure and dementia. Well, that's true. That's what these these data suggest. So uh, based on these data, yes, that is true um, and valid. There is, okay, B, there is a small chance that the results of this study were due to random occurrences rather than true correlation. That is also certainly true and certainly plausible here in this case. C, uh, and, and I should say that's actually plausible in basically any study. Uh, that That's the whole idea behind statistics and probability. Okay, C, low blood pressure events might deprive neurons of blood flow and lead to cell death resulting in dementia. Well, uh, yeah, the fact that it says might uh, makes this a valid statement, I think. Uh, that's certainly a plausible approach. In fact, if you go read the actual article, the authors state that much. They state the most apparent explanation for our findings is that orthostatic hypotension causes brain damage due to recurrent transial cerebral hypoperfusion. So, the, the, you know, it seems plausible and, and logical that uh, people who have this low blood pressure, low blood supply to the brain when they stand up, which typically lasts for a minute or so, uh, that, <clears throat> that this is causing some ischemic damage to neurons. So, okay, yeah, that's a valid statement, but did this study actually analyze that mechanism or whether that's actually true? No, not at all. That, that's not even remotely what this study looked at, but these sort of epidemiological studies are really good because they give us an idea of what we should go and experiment with. We should go and analyze uh, ischemic injury during the brief period of orthostatic hypotension and determine whether neurons can really die uh, and, and whether those mechanisms are in place. That, that would be a great research question. So, so epidemiologic studies don't prove causation per se, but they certainly give us an idea of, of further research ideas that we should pursue. Okay, D, <clears throat> dementia may be predicted by an inability of the sympathetic system to adequately respond to low blood pressure. Well, yeah, that's certainly <clears throat> plausible as well, so I'd say that's a valid statement. Um, in fact, the authors, I don't think, mention this at all in the paper, but uh, many types of dementia are actually well known to have an autonomic dysfunction. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it's quite plausible that dementia may be predicted by an inability of the sympathetic system to adequately respond to these low blood pressure events. It's sort of an autonomic dysfunction uh, it occurs in Parkinson's disease, for example. So it, it may be that the dementia is already starting through some other mechanism and these patients stand up out of bed and the neurons are already uh, being, uh, they're, they're already pathological to some degree and they're unable to exert that autonomic response that should speed up the heart and constrict the vessels and, and continue proper perfusion to the brain. So, so it's certainly a plausible mechanism as well. But again, this study didn't do anything to determine or study that. Okay. E, this study suggests that orthostatic hypotension causes dementia. Well, no, absolutely not. That is not a valid statement. And and this is where, th this is the reason that I say, you know, it'd be useful for uh, anyone, journalists or even the general public to take a statistics course because the limits of statistics here are that this study did not tell us causation. And certainly there seems to be a correlation here, but, um, <clears throat> and, and a statistically significant correlation, but, the the causative effects here can't be linked that one causes the other per se. Uh, and then finally, the patient sample studied may not be representative of the general population. Well, that is certainly true and a very, a very important point here. This is all out of uh, patients in the Netherlands. That may or may not uh, translate well to representing general population of other ethnicities and other genetics and other nations and other environmental factors and so on. So, 
So th that's a real world problem. The reason I even pulled this problem up is because I saw this a couple of years ago in a, in a news release. I, I always get emails of articles in all sorts of different specialties and fields, and I like to stay up to date with the literature. And, and this one just struck me as a little bit odd, so I went and looked up the study, and I just thought it was a good example of sort of uh, representing the power and the limits of statistics. And, uh, and so hopefully that gives you a real world sense of how you might go about analyzing these types of articles. Articles. You'll see dozens of them through through all of med school and residency and so on into, you know, the field of medicine is always evolving. And, and so your ability to keep up to date with current practices and effective practices really is determined by your ability to understand the literature. And, and that all comes from statistics. And so you'll see some doctors, they, they'll modify their practice very quickly based on some studies and, and not modify their clinical practice at all based on other studies. And you might wonder why. Well, you know, part of the reason is because some doctors um, are very empowered by their knowledge of statistics. But as human beings, we're also very empowered by uh, our personal experiences. And, and you'd be amazed at how just one patient outcome, whether good or bad, can really influence your perception of what is effective or not effective. And there have been many cases through medical history where where uh, you know a field in general has accepted that a certain treatment is very beneficial or useful and and once you an once you actually look at uh, good studies uh, across the population and, and realize that uh, some things are not nearly as effective and perhaps even harmful uh, it takes it takes a good trust and a good understanding of statistics to believe that data and change our knowledge and change our behavior in order to improve through time. And this is also why it's really important to conduct really good, high quality studies so that we don't have sort of wishy-washy evidences that we're not really sure about because the study wasn't designed well or the study had major limitations and things like that. One of the most useful techniques for proving to yourself that a study is indeed correct is actually um, not just one individual study, but doing a systematic review or a meta-analysis of multiple studies uh, that may have been conducted on different populations or at different time periods or in slightly different ways. And one of the groups that's done a really good job of this are the Cochrane Reviews. Uh, they've, they've done an excellent job of uh, huge meta-analyses that have influenced uh, the clinical practice of medicine substantially over the last couple decades. And uh, they do a really good job of sort of defining the limits, the strengths of each study that they include in their meta-analysis. And so th uh, that, that's also a really useful resource to look at those types of studies. All right, so that concludes the first part of this lecture, which is uh, biostatistics, epidemiology. Hopefully that all makes sense. There's plenty of good detail there, but uh, hopefully not too rapid and not, hopefully not too confusing. If you have any questions, again, you just please email and I'll, I'll try to sort that out for you. Now, let's move on to actually gathering our own data and how we would go about doing a, a study on this. So we're gonna, uh, through this whole next part of the semester, we're gonna talk about biosignals. These are signals that are obtained from the body. They give uh, information about some state of the body, often under autonomic control. And uh, just some examples that we're gonna do in this course include the electrocardiogram. Uh, we can do impedance plethysmography through the same leads as the electrocardiogram. It's essentially measuring resistance across the lung space while you breathe. And as you breathe in and out and your chest expands and contracts, uh, those impedance, the impedances change and you can measure that with the same leads as the ECG. Uh, we'll do uh, some oxygen saturation using using pulse oximetry, and there's a lot of cool um, sort of bioengineering there and how that works. And then uh, blood pressure as well, which you can use either invasive mechanisms like arterial lines, or you can use non-invasive mechanisms like oscillometry. Again, all of this actually involves a ton of really cool engineering uh, we probably won't talk too much about it, though, just to not overwhelm you. But if you're interested in that, again, uh, it's worth looking into. So we're going to use these biosignals and try to obtain some data. And, and so what we're going to do is sort of a visual experiment. 
So let's do a quick overview of the visual system. So uh, in the eye, we, we have the fovea, which is the center where, where most things are focused on the eye, and then the macula is sort of this density of photoreceptors around it. The fovea itself is where most of the photoreceptors sit. It's where we have the most resolution, the, the, the best color uh, discernment, and all these photoreceptors send their neural signals back through these uh, axons that go through this optic disc. You can see in this image on the left side that sort of whitish area, the white circle around where all the vessels are, are coming out of. So that whitish circle is called the optic disc. And that creates a blind spot because there's no photoreceptors there. It's really just a, a bundle of axons. So if, and you know, I used to do this in the course, <laughs> can't do it right now, but if you actually uh, stand back from an image and, and look straight at the image and then figure out where the blind spot is off to the side, you can calculate that the blind spot is about 16 degrees off of a straight axis. So then you might ask yourself, well, how do we see things? Why does the world look so coherent? Well, the brain essentially fills in that information. Somehow the brain is smart enough to know how to fill in the background so that we don't even notice that we have a blind spot. Now fortunately we have two eyes and so it can use information from both eyes to try and fill that in. Um, but even if you block midline, uh, you'll notice that the brain fills it in. Like if you're looking at something with a white background, it tends to fill in the blind spot with white. If, it, if you have a black background, it tends to fill in the the blind spot with black. So it's, it's pretty, a uh, pretty cool mechanism there. Well, then you might ask, how does the brain coherently combine information from two different eyeballs? Now we know that uh, the, the left visual field is processed at the right brain and the right visual field is processed on the left side of the brain. So uh, this diagram kind of shows how that happens different sides of the eyeball can either cross at the optic chiasm or continue on their uh, ipsilaterally so that they stay on the same side of the brain. And that's how we get essentially right visual field information that crosses over to the left side of the brain and uh, left visual field, whether it goes through the right eyeball or the left, it still will cross over and go to the right side of the brain. So um, this creates an interesting phenomenon when you present different information to different eyeballs. Uh, if you wear some 3D glasses that, for example, could be green on one eye and red on the other, you can look at an image like this and you'll perceive uh, you know, one image, like a face, through one eyeball and another image, the house, through the other eyeball. And <clears throat> interestingly, this makes the brain kind of wobble back and forth between the two images. And it turns out that for simple uh, visual stimuli, for example, like geometric shapes, like a house, which tends to be rectangles and squares and things, for simple geometric images, uh, our, our brain will naturally look at that for a short amount of time. But for more complex images, like a face, the brain tends to perseverate longer on the more complex stimulus. And you'll also notice, um, if, if you're able to <laughs> get 3D glasses and just look at this image at home, uh, or there there's, are many pairs in the lab, you're welcome to go grab a pair and take it home and, and look at these images on your own, uh, and then bring the glasses back, preferably. Um, but you can get them cheap on Amazon, too, if you want. Uh, so uh, if you look at this image and you try only to focus on one image, like, say, I tell you to look at the house only, you can do it for a couple seconds, but eventually you can't. You can't continue focusing on it. Your brain will naturally shift over and look at the other image. And there's probably a lot of good reason for that. Uh, for example, like evolutionarily, if, if, if you were a primitive human living in a, a jungle or something, you wanted to know whether the stripes of a tiger were showing behind a bunch of leaves, for example. If there's a tiger hiding in the bushes, you needed to not just be like, oh, those are pretty bushes. Your brain is naturally thinking, wait, is there something else there? What is it? Let's focus on it. And, and so your brain will naturally uh, go over, switch over, and continue uh, searching for a new sort of visual stimulus and, and trying to sort out what it might be. And uh, naturally, when we look at a face, there's a lot of features of the face that can uh, 
make that face unique to our brain and and we want to sort of piece out what is this face do i recognize this face what are the characteristics of this face and so um just naturally the brain tends to perseverate longer on these like i said so uh, faces tend to be processed and stored more in the fusiform area whereas geometric shapes tend to be processed in the parahippocampal area and so there's sort of different brain areas going on here but we really don't understand the underlying mechanisms that modulate this effect this effect actually turns out to be one of the reasons that uh, people tend to get headaches with the red and blue or the red and green 3d glasses in movies and part of the reason why those were discontinued now we have polarized glasses which do a much better job of not making your eyes focus back and forth between two different angles of two different colored images this effect was actually noticed quite long ago in the 1700s uh, and and there's been a lot of studies trying to pin down where you know what brain mechanisms what brain areas are responsible for modulating this what we have figured out is that uh, the the rate of binocular rivalry in other words switching back and forth between two images is affected by all sorts of things the complexity of the stimulus the size the brightness um, and we do know that it slows down with age and that uh, it's influenced by drugs for example alcohol certainly and other hallucinogens it can be influenced by psychiatric disorders and all evidence to date suggests that there are multiple levels of the visual pathway that can influence this binocular rivalry effect and and we do know that it can be influenced by conscious control as well so what we do in this lab is typically have students uh, do binocular rivalry measurements on themselves first uh, you'll look at arrows which are sort of the base we're going to call that the control group the base binocular rivalry rate so uh, looking at arrows uh, a left and a right arrow that are different colors uh, your brain will naturally sort of look back and forth between each arrow and it's okay you can try and focus on just one but you'll see that your brain will eventually make you shift back over and look at the other one for a moment and each time that your brain shifts its focus between the two arrows you just mark that and uh, mark that with a key on the computer and we have software in the lab that records this and you you tabulate how many uh, switches there were per minute during the experiment and that's sort of our base binocular rivalry rate and then what we're going to do is add some experimental conditions so instead of arrows we're going to do faces so a complex stimulus and we're going to see whether your rate speeds up or slows down and then uh, we'll also look at things like hyperventilation so breathing off your co2 getting alkalotic we'll see if that influences um, well it certainly influences vascular supply to the brain see if that influences the binocular rivalry rate as well and then we'll do hypoventilation where you try and hold your breath as much as possible during the experiment so each of these we're modifying one variable and we're seeing how it affects the results so those are the experimental conditions we're going to compare them to the control of just arrows alone all right so i'm going to walk you through some example data and then you're going to write just a one page doesn't need to be any longer than one page in fact please don't make it longer than one page uh, lab report and what we're trying to accomplish here is just make sure that you can accurately report experimental data with statistical analysis so uh, you'll make just a brief introduction talking about binocular rivalry perception and the, the alternation rate and what that is just make it one sentence and or you know maybe two or three sentences and then uh, talk very briefly about what experiment you conducted what comparisons were made and what statistical techniques you used and then the main paragraph that's going to be graded is your results so <clears throat> uh, you're going to have a spreadsheet document and we're gonna do this in Excel Excel is probably one of the worst statistics programs to exist but it does the job and it's something that you all have access to and uh, you know uh, a lot of different uh, institutions use different types of statistical software uh, and it depends a lot on whether you're doing research study like bench research or clinical studies there there's so many different types of good statistics software that even if you learned one you'd probably have to learn another for something else later so uh, the main point of this isn't <laughs> it's not to become experts at statistical analysis it's more just to get the basics understand you know how we do it in Excel which will make you manually walk through all the steps so that's good and then uh, 
you can apply it better later on. Uh, some of the best uh, uh, stuff that I've used is, is MATLAB. I really like that. There's SPSS for more clinical trial stuff. There's R, which is great for showing data in lots of different, very useful uh, ways. So um, all those types of programming and, and software skills will definitely benefit you. Okay, so when we open up the data in Excel, it's just going to look something like this. You can see here that we have uh, the data sorted out uh, by subject, and e each row is a different subject. And there's columns on the left that let you put in more information that you may want to do subgroup analysis on later, like whether someone was male or female, whether they were right or left eye dominant, things like that. But for now, that information does not matter. You can see here that the way this data is arranged is that uh, we have arrows and all these numbers are in units of changes per minute so uh, for the top person for example they recorded that when they were looking at arrows they had 33 changes per minute you know about one every two seconds so uh, they their eyes their their perception alternated back and forth between the left and right arrows that many times per minute now the next column faces it looks like the the top person uh, had a lower amount per minute, and that would seem to correlate with what we expect. Uh, faces are more complex stimulus. There should be fewer changes per minute than with the arrows. And then when the when this particular person uh, hyperventilated, uh, it showed that they had a lot more alternations per minute. So um, we obviously can't extract any significance from one person, but what we're gonna do is look at this group of data and I've left off hypoventilation here. I don't want to skew your results too much, but let me show you how to uh, actually put in these functions in Excel and go about doing this statistical analysis. So uh, we're going to first learn how to put in some basic functions. So let's just do average, for example. So you would type uh, in, the, in this sort of command box up at the top above the ABCD columns. You can see up there it says equals average and then parentheses, and we put in the columns, uh, you know, go from box D4 and then a colon down to box D20. That defines the group of boxes that we want to average, and then we just do close parentheses at the end and hit enter. It's going to give us uh, the average of that group of numbers that we've selected. Now you can actually go back to the that command line box, the function box, and just click on D4 to D20 and you'll see they show up in colors, you can actually go reselect that box or drag the edge of that box to select a different uh, set of numbers if you wish. But uh, that, that's the basics of how you add in a function there. Now we can go down to the standard deviation. And again here, th there are many ways of calculating standard deviation, but we're just gonna keep it very generic. We're gonna say equals STDEV, so standard deviation, parentheses, and we're gonna do it on that same set of data, the same box D4, D20, and close parentheses, hit enter. And then the standard error of mean, um, it's not a specific function in Excel, but it's calculated from the standard deviation. All it is is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of samples in our data. And so to get the number of samples in our data, we can use a function called count. So it counts the number of data points from box D4 to D20, and then we take the square root of that, SQRT, and we divide the standard deviation by that square root of the count. So that gives us our standard error of mean. Now we should take a little excursion here and talk about standard deviation. So that is basically showing the dispersion or the spread of the data in the bell curve, sort of like how wide is the bell curve or how narrow or thin is the bell curve. So what's the difference between standard error of the mean and the standard deviation? Well, let's imagine that we, we take many different samples from our population group. So we do this experiment multiple times. What we're going to do is uh, get multiple means that all vary slightly. So in sample one, we, we let's say we take you know uh, ten data points or something and and find the mean of those, and then we do it all over again and take ten other random samples from the population and average those and and get the mean again. Those means are all going to vary slightly, and so it turns out rather than doing this experiment and many, many times and getting many different uh, data samples, 
we can actually estimate how much the mean would vary between each of our samples by simply taking the standard deviation and dividing it by the square root of the number of uh, data points in our sample. And that's what the standard error of mean is. It's telling us basically how much would the average vary in our various sample sizes. Uh, if, if that's not confusing enough, um, another way of saying it is uh, basically quantifying how precisely the mean of the population is known from uh, from a sample. So uh, basically SEM is always smaller than standard deviation. So in a lot of experiments you'll see people use the standard error of mean because it makes their error bars look nice and tight and makes the data look more significant. So that's not a valid reason to use the standard error of mean. Showing the standard error of mean doesn't really give a good idea of the spread, especially if looking at how each individual parameter changed from one treatment to another. Uh, the standard deviation gives a better idea of the variability in individual responses, but the standard deviation is uh, only one value that sort of uh, underemphasizes statistical significance as well. So, um, <clears throat> So really, this is again is why I mentioned earlier that box and whiskers plot is kind of the best type of error bar to show on your means um, to express significance or to give an idea of how one group might be significantly different from another group. But in this case, we are going to show standard error of mean as our error bars to show how precisely the mean of the population is known. Okay, so now we can simply uh, outline all these boxes here and just drag them over to the right and it will calculate the values for each column. So that's fast and easy. Then uh, in order to do our data analysis we're going to go over to the data tab and click the data analysis button. Go up to and think about what's the first thing you should do. Uh, well it's the analysis of variance, ANOVA, single factor because there's one factor that varies between each of these experimental groups. So we're going to click that click the outline box to outline what data we're analyzing, which is all three columns. And we set our alpha at 0.05, that's our threshold for um, significance. And then just click output, and you can do it into a separate page or a single page. And there it gives us the ANOVA single factor analysis. And actually you can see here that it did our averages for us. And in addition, it calculates variance, which is related to standard deviation. And then further down, it gives us the sum of squares and degrees of freedom with an F value, and then from the F value, the larger the F value uh, means a smaller P value. So it gives us the F value that would have been the threshold for the cutoff for significance, and then it also gives us uh, the P value, which in this case is 4.77 times 10 to the negative sixth. So it's very, very small. So we know that something amongst these groups is significant, significantly different. We just don't know what. For that, we need a post hoc test. A post hoc test, there's a whole variety of them. We won't go into the details of why you would choose one over the other today, but uh, some of the more popular ones are Tukey's or the student newman kuhls test. Uh, but in our case, we're just going to manually run multiple comparison t-tests on all the potentially significant experimental conditions compared to our control group. So it's worth pointing out that when you uh, write your results, I'm going to have you report um, both the F value and the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom are the number of columns, the number of groups, minus one. That's where the two came from. And then also the number of data points, minus one in each group. And you add up all three groups. And then the sum of squares, that's the total sum of squares of the variation. So it's sort of saying, you know, there's this total mass amount of variation amongst all the groups. And so the statistician's job is basically to go and explain where all that variation is coming from. So some of it will be variation between the two groups, and some of it is variation within each group. And, and so that's where the variances help us out here. So it's okay if you don't remember all those details. Uh, the main idea here is just to go through the process of how you actually obtain a valid p-value. So let's go ahead and do our t-value calculations now. So uh, go back to the data analysis tab and uh, go down, scroll down to t-test. And we're going to choose two sample assuming unequal variances because we can see from our ANOVA that the variances are unequal between groups. And go ahead and put an output range again. We're going to keep alpha, the significance cutoff factor at 0.05. 
And now we have to choose each combination of groups. So we're gonna compare the arrows, which we're calling our control group. We're gonna compare that to faces, for example. So uh, variable one range is gonna be our arrows group. Variable two range is gonna be our faces group. And then all we have to do is hit okay. And it should put out our statistics here. So again, uh, this t-test gives us the values of our, uh, our mean and the variance uh, and uh, degrees of freedom. And it gives uh, two different p-values here. One is a one-tailed and one is a two-tailed. And remember, we don't know whether uh, uh, faces is gonna be a higher or lower value than arrows. So we should use the two-tail uh, p-value here which in this case turns out to be eight times 10 to the negative fifth. So very, very small. So these two are certainly significantly different. And uh, you can report that p-value in the lab report. Now let's go ahead and run our second t-test. So this one again, we're just gonna go to t-test sample, uh, ass uh, assuming unequal variances, choose our variable range. Variable one range again is gonna be the arrows and variable two range is our arrows with hyperventilation. And so we click that, put an output range that doesn't overlap with our prior t-test, and then click OK. And this will give us again our results. And we can see the two-tailed p-value here is 0 0.06. So in this case, we would call this non-significant. Uh, we don't say insignificant, we say non-significant. Now from here, uh, we would like to graph our results. So go ahead and go to insert and insert a column graph. And then uh, we can go over to the design tab and it'll let us format the graph in different ways. You can put a chart title in, you can put in uh, axis labels, um, all of these things. And most importantly, make sure you put the error bars in. So, oh, and I should say, um, backing up a little bit here, if you don't have the uh, data analysis tab in your Excel, it, it actually does not come naturally. Um, you need to go into File, Options, go down uh, and uh, say Excel add-ins, click Go, and uh, go over, make sure Analysis Tool Pack is clicked, and hit OK, and then it should show up in the top right there under the Data tab. Okay, so you can go into your graph, you can edit all sorts of things. You should have a chart title at least and some access labels. And uh, make sure you go to the graph, right click and say select data source and make sure you select the averages from each column. So that'll show up in the bar graph. And then you can edit the labels for each uh, column by just hitting access labels, edit, and you can actually just select the words that you've already typed in over each column and hit okay. And then that should make your graph show up nicely. Um, make sure that for anything that's significantly different from the control group that you put asterisks above it, the instructions are in the lab report instructions. So um, if it's you know, a uh, p-value less than 0.05, put one asterisk. If you put, uh, if it's a p-value less than 0.0, 0.001 and you'll put three asterisks um, and make sure you put in error bars. Excel lets you do a predefined set of error bars, either standard error or standard deviation. But just to make sure that we know what we're doing, let's make sure you go to add chart element, error bars, go down to more error bar options uh, and then click custom, specify value and then go put in your custom calculations for the standard error of mean, both for the positive and negative values of the error bar, and that should line up with uh, the appropriate value for each of the columns. And again, you can see why the error bars are a very generic uh, representation of the variance in, in the group. Um, <clears throat> they, again, we should be using box and whiskers plot. I know I've said that a hundred times, but uh, it is a better way of sort of showing almost like confidence intervals. It shows you what's actually happening within each group. I should also point out too that overlapping error bars do not necessarily indicate uh, uh, non-significance. And if the error bars between two groups are not overlapping, that doesn't necessarily indicate significance either. You can kind of get an idea from it, but um, but these error bars, uh, whether they're overlapping or not, does not indicate any amount of significance. That's sort of a separate concept. Okay, so you'll all have the same data. You should all get the same results. And uh, that lab report will be due by lab next week.
and uh, uh, hopefully this has been a fun whirlwind of a refresher for you. Uh, thanks, everyone.